It's episode 207 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Thanks for joining me for these 200 plus episodes. You can find all of the archives of those 200 plus episodes over at hankgarner.com or authorstoriespodcast.com. I'd like to thank some sponsors this week. Dominion Rising, 23 all new novels, brand new, never before released in this one package for pre-sale right now, only 99 cents. Uh, it goes live in uh, just a couple of weeks now, so go grab it while you can get 23 brand new novels by some of the best writers today for only 99 cents. A lot of the uh, early reviews are coming in, and they are fantastic. Dominion Rising, there's a link to it in the show notes. Also, the new novel from Stefan Bolt, Six String. A beautifully written masterpiece by Stefan Boltz. If you are a fan of his writing like I am, you know that there are certain things you can expect. You expect you can expect stories that take a turn that you never saw coming and ones that just grip you by the heart. Uh, six string from Stefan Boltz. Go pick it up today. Also, Galactic Satori Chronicles from Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. Uh, some of the very best science fiction that you will read today is going on right now in the Galactic Satori Chronicles. There's two volumes, Volume 1 Earth and Volume 2 Kron. Go pick them up today. They carry the author story seal of approval. Also, my good friend Ed Gosney runs a blog called Cool Comics in My Collection, and every Thursday he releases a new collection of comics, ones from his collection, ones that sadly got away, and he also finds a way to connect it to what's going on uh, in his life and his collections. So go check out uh, Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Also, like I told you last week, his uh, book, Transmutations, the audio book is out now, and it's fantastic. I've been listening to it. I think you're going to love it. Uh, go pick that up, edgosney.com. As always, at the end of the show, we're going to have a clip from my good friend Richard Gleaves and his Jason Crane series. Thank you for listening to Author Stories. And uh, like I've told you before, uh, we've been invited to cover Dragon Con this year. If you would like to help support that effort to upgrade some equipment and uh, to make it the best we can, go to paypal.me slash author Hank Garner and you can donate today. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thanks for listening. is dying at the hands of a brutal empire. Brother Dust, a changeling born amidst a sandstorm, has seen it all before. He's watched as the heavy imperial boots have crushed dozens of planets, watched as their drills pierce the core of a world, slowly killing it while the natives are kept docile and compliant with the gifts and pleasures the empire brings from the stars. He will watch no more. Brother Dust will use his ability to mold his own body into devastating weapons to wage a one-man war against the malevolent High Father and the Empire's diabolical machines. The body count is rising, but the Empire must be stopped. From the writing team of Steve Bowyer and Aaron Hall comes Brother Dust, The Resurgence. Pick it up today on Amazon.com. Brother Dust, The Resurgence. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I'm really excited to have Matthew Quick on the show. Matthew is the author of uh, numerous books. Uh, Some of them uh, you may be very well acquainted with. Uh, One of those books was the Silver Linings Playbook, which uh, was uh, made into a movie and an Oscar-winning movie uh, as well. Uh, He's also... Uh, been the recipient of the Penn Hemingway Award, uh, honorable mention, among many other things. Uh, welcome to the show, Matthew. Hey, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Wow. Um, trying to answer this question honestly by searching my memory. <laughs> Uh, the first thing that comes to mind was writing a short story either in sixth or seventh grade. 
And my teacher pulled me aside and asked if she could read it in front of the class. And I remember feeling terrified, um, but also feeling as though um, I was singled out was was kind of a a new thing for me. You know, I didn't think of myself as somebody who would be singled out. And I remember she read it in front of the class. And of course, no one in the class cared one way or the other about the story. <laughs> um, but I remember she, you know, said that this, this is good. Like you, you have something here and you should keep writing. And there was something inside of me that felt like she wasn't lying to me, that she meant it and that, you know, I had put some effort, effort, extra effort into that assignment and it, it just felt right. And I remember too, um, you know, that mix of dread and also excitement of sharing because, right. you know, for the first time I felt like maybe I was stepping out a little bit and being authentic. And, um, you know, in the neighborhood where I grew up, you know, it was kind of a blue collar neighborhood outside of Philadelphia. You didn't do things like that. It wasn't a safe thing to do. Um, but it felt daring. It felt thrilling. And, uh, you know, I was hooked. I, I kept writing from then on. Yeah, I uh, as someone who grew up in rural Mississippi, uh, I can completely, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I can commiserate with you there. You know, if you're the kid that wants to write you sure. know, and everybody's kind of giving the side eye, you know, um, uh, do you remember what to, what it was that you wrote or what the uh, you know, what was it about that thing that uh, made you want to put that extra effort in? You know, I really I remember the story had something to do with being outside in winter, if I remember correctly, like maybe trying to define shelter. But I, I really don't know. I could be totally making that up. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't really remember what made me want to put the extra effort in. I just knew that um, it was something I enjoyed. And I didn't really enjoy school at all. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I'm I'm an INFJ on the Myers-Briggs. So if, if I don't see the point of something, I don't I don't really put a lot of effort into it. Uh, you know, and I'm kind of, I kind of follow my intuition, you know, that that's, that's my driving, uh, force, you know, and, you know, so I think intuitively I, I just really, it was something that, um, I was drawn to, you know, later in high school, I tell the story all the time. I, it was the first time I started dealing with anxiety and depression, although I didn't know what anxiety and depression was when I was 16. It just felt like something weird was happening inside of me that wasn't happening to all of my other friends. And writing writing became this um, place where I went where I could make that feeling not go away, but lessen. Um, it became bearable uh, when I was writing. And you know, at first I was writing fiction and poetry, and you know, I, I, I don't know if I would say I was journaling, but it was just kind of taking all the chaos in my mind and my chest and just doing something with it, organizing it on the page. And, and that, that really is when I got hooked on writing. It became um, a way for me to process things that I wasn't fully aware of or even ready to process. It just became almost like an organizing tool. Um, and, and then I was really hooked. You know, that's, a, that's really the power of writing and writing fiction uh, especially is and, – and I don't, I don't think we talk about that enough – is the power to take these things that we're feeling and maybe these circumstances that we are uh, maybe living in the midst of and processing and giving those things over to someone else and, and helping them deal with them on the page, uh, which then in turn – uh, kind of bleeds back over into us as the writer and, and maybe hopefully uh, to the reader as well. Yeah, 100%. And I was, I was benefiting from that the other way as a reader, you know, in, in high school as well. Um, and, you know, I, I knew that when I was reading novels, um, you know, even classics like Tale of Two Cities or, you know, uh, The Old Man in the Sea, like, I, I realized that people, you know, Dickens and Hemingway or whomever they you know even Shakespeare like they were they were they were psychologists they were they were trying to figure out what makes human tick tick and what uh you know what's going on inside our minds and you know processing those emotions what does it mean to be human and that was something intuitively I was very interested in as a young person because I wasn't very comfortable in my own skin um you know I'm still not I wasn't 
I, I never really felt comfortable to be a human being. And so that, that was very interesting to me, um, you know, starting at 16 and even now in the work that I do, it's, it's what it's about. You know, how do we get through this existence on the planet? What does it mean? Um, can, can we figure that out? Like, what are we supposed to be doing? All oh, those big questions you're always trying to answer. Um, and I think when you're 15, you, you kind of figure that out for the first time. Like there are these big questions, but you don't really have the vocabulary or, or the means to really deal with it. So you go to literature and you write and you read and, and that's, that's where you start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we get really deep, uh, in, in those waters, uh, I, I wanted to, to touch on something real quick that you said a minute ago about, uh, when the teacher called on you, uh, to share that story with the class and you felt like, uh, that the rest of the class really didn't get it and they didn't really care. Uh, but you honed in on the fact that the teacher cared and you had made a connection uh, with that person, whether the rest of it, uh, the rest of them made a connection or not. And uh, I think that's a very important thing as a writer to, uh, to get a grasp on is that the whole world is not going to be your audience, uh, but there will be a few. Uh, and when you connect with them, you have done everything. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think I'm I'm very proud of where I, where I come from. You know, the people that I grew up with, um, I admire, and um, you know, I, I definitely consider myself one of them. But there are things going on with me at the time that weren't going on with again with my friends. And uh, the world is big, you know, and I knew that in high school, too. Like, I love playing basketball. You know, I, I played ball every day, but I wasn't going to do that for the rest of my life. Like, I knew there was a world outside of playing basketball in Oakland and Collingswood, New Jersey, or playing soccer or sports or whatever. And, um, you know, and I, even when I publish now, you know, I've been on book tour for the last three three weeks. And when I'm giving a talk about my book, I can look out into an audience of, you know, sometimes hundreds. And you can pick out the dozen or so people who really get what you're saying. Um, you know, and there are people that are thrilled to be there or enjoy your work. But the people who really understand what's driving you, I can always pick them out in the crowd. And, you know, just by the way that they're looking at me. And when they come through the line, they'll say something that let me lets me know that they understand the work in a way that maybe even other people who are enjoy the work or buy the work, which I'm always happy for, um, aren't taking the same thing away. And, you know, I, I think that I started writing when I was, you know, 12 or whatever, because I was, I was really lonely and I wanted to make those connections. And, you know, here at 43 years of age, almost 44, there's still that, like that hunger for connection. Um, and I think that's what keeps you writing, going back to the page. And if everybody got your work, if everybody universally said, this is amazing, I, I don't know if, if, if that would ruin the work or not. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe I'd like to have that problem. It'd be a good problem to have. But, uh, uh, you know, I think. Well, well I, you know, I don't know if it'll ruin the work, but immediately half of that audience will leave because they'll call you a sellout. Well, that's that's true, too. <laughs> you know, that's the that's the other side of the coin. Right. Um, yeah, it's a weird thing. You know, it's it is. It's it's not special if it's connecting with everyone. Maybe I I don't know. Um, it's it's really bizarre. Yeah, it is bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Um, you you went to uh, to college and double majored in English and secondary ed. Uh, what uh, what brought on that decision to pursue, um, you know that that education? And did you know? Uh, that that this was the education you were going to pursue because uh, you were going to be a writer or, uh, you know, did you see yourself as being a teacher long term? Kind of what were you thinking in those late uh, high school, early college years? I'll try to give you this this short version. Um, I, you know, when I was a junior or senior, I wanted to write. I was interested in writing. But, of course, you talk to your guidance counselor about, you know, what you should do in life or you talk to the adults in your life and you say, hey, I want to be a fiction writer. And they say, pick again. You know, like that's that's not going to work <laughs> out for you. Um, so, you know, my father is a very pragmatic man. And, you know, he said you have to have some type of degree that will get you health insurance and the pension and all that. And, you know, I tell this story and I. I draw it out when I tell it in front of a crowd and try to play it for laughs. But, you know, there was a day in my senior year of high school where I'm looking at my high school English teacher and saying, you know, 
they get out at three o'clock. They just have to talk about books all day. They have the summers off. And I thought being a high school English teacher would be super easy. And there'd be a lot of time left over for writing. And, you know, I always laugh and all the teachers in the room laugh because after seven years of teaching, if you care about teaching and you're actually a decent human being and you care about your students, you know, being a high school English teacher is one of the most time consuming, difficult jobs there are. And I, no one tells you that when you sign up to be a high school English teacher, because no one would be a high school English teacher if they told you you're going to spend 20 hours every weekend grading essays. And, you know, if you're <laughs> counseling kids on your your periods off and, you know, so I, I I went into it thinking, you know, this would afford me a lot of time. And, you know, when I got to college and I started taking education classes, I, I took it pretty seriously. And when I started teaching um I, I took teaching very seriously, and I thought to myself somewhere through that I can either be a great teacher and not write, or I can write while I'm teaching and be a bad teacher. And I didn't have it in me to be a bad teacher, and that's not really me bragging because I'm kind of a perfectionist. It's it's a problem for me. If I do something, I, I need to do it all the way, and that has created, you know, bad mental health situations for me. Um, so teaching, you know, when I, I started to teach, I, I taught in a really prestigious high school um, with high level kids and they were really demanding. And the classes I was teaching to, you know, sophomores in high schools were tougher than the classes I took in college um, by far. Uh, and, and it was exciting and thrilling. And, you know, seven years went by really really quickly. And then all of a sudden I said, Oh my God, I'm not writing and I'm going to be 30. And what happened? And it, it scared the hell out of me. Um, and that's when I quit teaching and started to pursue writing full time. I also was telling my students who were very privileged and could do anything they wanted really. I mean, these kids were, were overeducated. They had money. Most of them did anyway. And they were all being pushed into the math and sciences. And, you know, art was kind of like a hobby. And I was telling them, if you want to write, you know, or you want to make art, you should. Like, that should be a priority. And I felt like a hypocrite because I wasn't making my own writing a priority. Um, so that that was also one of the reasons, you know, I, after six or seven years of telling kids that fiction writing matters, I kind of woke up one day and said, does it? Because you're not doing it. So you got to prioritize this or you're, you're a hypocrite and you're lying to these kids. And so that was, that was one of the motivating factors. The other was I was profoundly miserable as a high school English teacher. It just, I'm an, int I'm an introvert by nature. And so going into a school teeming with hundreds of students every day is not a good recipe for an introvert's mental health. And it took a, it took a toll on me. That's a really hard, uh, bitter pill to swallow when when you uh, your advice uh slaps you in the face and and you realize that you're uh you're you're being a hypocrite um that's uh what did you um uh, like what what would you tell your students about why fiction matters what, what was the message you were trying to get across to them well i had um front and center in my classroom i had a picture of kurt vonnegut with a baby in his arms. I'm not sure who the baby was. Um, but I had a quote by Kurt Vonnegut and I'll just paraphrase cause I'll never get it right. But it basically said, uh, I've often wondered why I read fiction when presidents and lawyers and decision makers don't read novels. And the answer is that students read them and it's our job to infect young minds with humanity before they go out and become presidents and leaders or, you know, people that make decisions. And, you know, I, I was always telling my students that we read literature to push the needle towards empathy, to push it towards understanding, um, you know, to remind us uh, that those things matter, that bring us back to, you know, the humanities. And, and uh, you know, that was really what I was trying to do, especially with these kids who, again, were so privileged and were going to go out and, and probably make decisions for people and be leaders. Um, and we're constantly being encouraged to get the highest grade, like win in the sports team, get the highest number on the SAT, get into the best Ivy League school. Uh, and oftentimes in order to accomplish all of those things, empathy, understanding, kindness, uh, that stuff sometimes got pushed to the side. And so I was always trying to bring them back to um, – you know, 
again, empathy, kindness, compassion, like these things matter. Uh, it's what makes you a human being. Uh, and you know, the number that you get on the SAT doesn't really matter, uh, especially after you, you get your college acceptance letter. Um, you know, so that, that was really one of the messages that I was trying to get across. Um, and you know, again, one of the lessons that I learned through teaching was you have to be compassionate to yourself as well. Um, and you know, I, I grew up again in a blue collar town. So like putting art first or putting fiction writing first felt a little selfish to me. And I had to get over that and say, you know, this is something you want to do and you've got to practice self-compassion and you've got to understand that this is, this is in you. And if you, if you don't do this thing, um, the best part of you is going to die. And I would tell that to my students. And I had students that were great musicians or, you know, some of them were fantastic writers or some of them were dancers or some of them wanted to be poets. And, you know, they would come to me, you know, it's the same thing. You know, I, I, when I was in high school, I went to my guidance counselor and said, I want to be a novelist. And they said, pick again. And, you know, these kids would say to me, you know, I want to be a writer, I want to be a musician, but, you know, my parents want me to go be a chemist or an engineer, you know, the classic story. And I would say you should be, you know, you should, you should do the thing that's in you to do, or, you know, that, that, that good part of you, that spark, you know, that piece of you that wants to be a good human being is going to become very bitter and die. And, you know, I was looking in the mirror every night and seeing that is exactly what was happening to me. So it was, uh, it was a, it was a rough period in my life, but it was it was a necessary one. Well, in reading your books, uh, you obviously went out and practiced what you preached because your your books are, uh, you know, are are character studies. They are thank you. Uh, they they peel back the layers of humanity, and that's that's the thing that is so striking to me when I read your work is that uh, these are people that I feel like I know. Uh, feel like people that I, I can relate them to actual people I know and not just that I become, you know, I come to know your characters, but like I, I can actually like place these people in my life. Um, when you decided to write that first book, when you, when you left teaching and you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, what was the, what was the initial idea you had? And did that idea come to fruition in that first book that you published? Um, well, I, I had written several books before the Silver Lining, like after I quit teaching and um, in the interim before I published Silver Linings, I had written four or five novels, you know, and the, they weren't very good. Uh, they were kind of me just furiously practicing, you know, like just getting a lot of stuff out. And uh, I went and did an MFA and I had this idea in my head, like most young writers do, that you know, I had to be a certain type of writer. Um, and in my mind, that was, you know, a very literary, highbrow, well-respected type writer um, that would flourish, you know, in academia or wherever. And, you know, that was, I don't know why I thought that, um, but that's, you know, I, I had the, the, the MFA snob thing going on. That's the easiest way to put it, you know. And, <laughs> and so I went to to Goddard in Vermont, which is not a snobby place at all. It's, it's, it's a very, um, progressive, you know, college that would used to be extremely hippie and in the spec in the sixties. And it's a really cool, inclusive place, but I carried that baggage that I needed to be this certain type of writer because that was the best type of writer in my mind. And, um, you know, I had all the, the hangups about genre and, you know, I, the stupid thing, and I often say that when you don't have any work, you, you think that your opinions are really important. You think that's the thing that makes you a writer before you publish. I think it's really important to have the right opinions. Um, and after you publish and after you have a little success maybe, or maybe when you just grow up, you realize that it's the work that's important. It's not the opinions. Um, and of course, if the work's any good, it's got to be a true reflection of, of who you are authentically. And, you know, I, I love... I don't know. Like, I, I love, you know, someone like John Updike or Jonathan Franzen. Like I can admire those books and I think they're brilliant. And, you know, on, on some level, I know that those people have a lot more talent than I do, but they're not, that's not who I am. You know, I couldn't write a book like Jonathan Franzen. That's not who Matthew Quick is. 
And, you know, going through the MFA process was one of, of kind of looking in the mirror and, and saying, why are you trying to be something that you're not? Um, and I remember being very frustrated by the MFA experience because I was writing stuff that was inauthentic and people were telling me that, you know, the feedback was like, we don't really get what this is and this doesn't seem authentic or, or maybe it was just like, we don't like this, you know, and, and it was frustrating. And I remember I was going for a run one day. And I was kind of um, just at a low point, really frustrated with the work I was doing. And it was this cold winter day in my memory anyway. And, you know, I was running. It was dark in New England. And I saw this cloud peek out from behind. Um, I mean, excuse me. I saw the sun peek out from behind this, this cloud. And it was just gorgeous. And, uh, you know, it was like a silver lining. And I thought to myself, oh, what if it's an omen, you know, that I'm going to make it as a writer? And I said, that's stupid. That's magical thinking. You can't believe that. And I thought, what if I had a character who believed that? You know, what if I had a character, you know, who was in this low spot that was, um, you know, in need of like this false hope to buoy him to bring him up? And that's that's really the day that Pat Peoples was born. And, you know, once I started to write about Pat Peoples, I... I started to write um, about mental illness for the first time. And, you know, Pat has suffered brain trauma, um, but he also, you know, has lost a, a wife and he, he'd been a bad human being and he was trying to become a better man. And, you know, that's really where I was too, you know, in this place where uh, I hadn't been living authentically. And, you know, I'd been hiding the fact that I deal with anxiety and depression and I, I'd been wearing this mask like I thought I was going to be this this like uber academic writer or, you know, this literary guy. And I said to myself, why don't you just write a novel in the in the voice that sounds like the people that you grew up with, um, you know, that that you could see um, being made even into a, a movie that you would like to go go see or um, just something that you would really enjoy reading, something that's really authentically you. And when I gave myself permission to do that, I was off. You know, I started writing in this voice that, you know, was the voice of somebody who is from a blue collar town and, you know, suburban Philadelphia outside of Philly. Um, someone who was infatuated with the Eagles, which, you know, I was growing up. And I started writing about father son issues, which were kind of relevant to my life. And um, the writing just came out of me in this new way that was. It was, I won't say it was easy, but it flowed, um, you know, kind of got into that flow state and it was going so well that I was terrified because I knew halfway through that I had something. And after my wife read it, she said, oh my God, this is it. Uh, and then of course, when we got the movie deal and, you know, when we, we sold it to first Strauss and Giroux uh, and it became real, I was terrified. And, you know, for six months before the book came out, I was, I was really in a dark place mental health wise, um, because I was so afraid of people seeing me without the mask on. Um, you know, I, I wasn't that MFA guy, you know, snobby MFA guy with a lot of opinions. Like this was like Matthew quick naked in front of you, you know, this is, this was me, you know, and I didn't have anything to hide behind. And, uh, that was, that was really terrifying. But again, I also think the people who read that, in manuscript form and said, there's something here. I'd like to think they saw the authenticity of it. Um, they saw that it was raw. They saw that it wasn't me fronting. It was me just being me. And it was me talking about mental health for the first time, which was, which was terrifying. Um, you know, when people ask, what is the book about? I would say, oh, it's about Eagles football, just because I didn't want to talk about mental health. Um, so... But but it's crazy because uh, for all of the pretentious airs we put on, uh, the thing that really hits home with people is when we do lay ourselves bare and tell the truth. Yeah. Um, the, my last book, uh, Writer's Block, was uh, – I, I haven't really talked about it on the show, but um, uh, my daughter uh, had a brain tumor and was going through uh, – several surgeries oh. to, to deal with that. And uh, I wrote this book in the midst of it. And it's about a, a writer who uh, is, is stuck and, and can't figure out what to do. And you, you find out that he's had all this tragedy in his life. And, and it was my way of processing um, kind of what was going on with my daughter and, and my offer 
to trade places with her if mm-hmm. I could, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and that's the book that, uh, you know, I get emails from people. I, I literally got an email from this lady and she said, I hate you. You made me snot. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, that's, that's like one of the best compliments you could yeah, ever get, beautiful. you know, and, and it's, and it's because, you know, you, you, you know, took the mask off and, and, and told the truth and, uh, and your books have obviously done that. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you realize this or not, but most people's first book uh, that gets published don't go on to be Oscar <laughs> uh, movies starring very beautiful people yeah. and and all of that it's stuff. Shame. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know that's it's crazy. I, I know you've never thought yeah. of that, um, but you know, you talk about going through this dark place where um, uh, you know you're really terrified of of the thing being out there for people to see and scrutinize uh, and all that. But what was the, uh, what was the, the actual experience? Like when the book came out, when the movie came out and, and all of that, did you get feedback from people that was unexpected? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you get all kinds of feedback, uh, good, bad, um, you know, it, it, just the whole spectrum. I had friends, you know, with whom I had, gone to Eagles games with or, you know, I'd known for years that, you know, basically came out to me about their mental health problems. You know, they, they would say things like, um, you know, I can't believe we never talked about this stuff before. Like, I never thought we could, but, you know, me too. Or like, you know, or what's going on with you? Where did this, where did this, these ideas come from? And I would kind of open up and all of a sudden there'd be this new conversation, which was super cool. Um, people in my family who I thought weren't going to be fans, like suddenly were on board. Um, you know, and I often say that, you know, when you say you're going to quit your job and go write a novel, like nobody is on board. You know, my wife was, (laughs) but then when someone pays you money, like everyone's on board and, that, right. that's it's kind of cool but it's also kind of sad at the same time as well um uh you know it's it's not even a bandwagon jumping thing or a front runner thing it's just it's a shame because the the book and those ideas existed before they were validated by money and success and fame right. and so when you see that people are really attracted to the fact that you know you went to the oscars i often joke that I've written, you know, really thoughtful essays about my work or, you know, I've given interviews that I'm super proud of that I put on Facebook or Twitter that have gotten like five likes. But, you know, I put a picture of my Oscar (laughs) tickets on Facebook and it got hundreds and maybe even thousands of likes instantly. And so you, you, of course it did. you, You start to see like what moves people and what what people are interested in. And that part can be a little tricky because obviously you you want it to be the the thing, you know, the ideas, the words in your book. Um, Also, you know, when the book came out, there were tons of people who supported me and were really cool about it. Um, But then when the movie came out, some people that never had taken an interest all of a sudden were calling and say, hey, I want a a first edition copy of your book now that the movie's out. And you say, well, then you should have bought it like years ago. You know, like there's there's, there's a lot of weird (laughs) you know, stuff. And, you know, I don't mean to suggest that, um, you know, I'm not grateful or, you know, I'm not aware that how privileged you are to be in that position, but psychologically it can, um, it can put you through, it can put you into some weird places with, with people, uh, especially friends and family, you know, there, there's also too, and this is not just my experience. This is experience of a lot of writers. The more success you have, oftentimes the, the less writer friends you have, like people drop away. Um, it's so hard to make it in, in, you know, make your living as a fiction writer that when you have a success, it, it tests your relationships with other writers, particularly, um, because, you know, the fiction writing world is not fair. Like it's not merit based. It's not, you know, it's someone might have worked just as hard as you did. And someone might have written a story that maybe even you think that their novel is better. But that doesn't mean that it will also be made into an Oscar winning film. And that that is a tough pill for anyone to deal with. And, 
you know, there's also weird things that come up like survivor's guilt, you know, kind of why, why did my thing happen and not, you know, to some of my friends who have written really great pieces or great novels or, um, so a lot of weird feelings come up and I, I share that not to suggest that I'm not aware of how privileged I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm really appreciative. Believe me, like I think about this stuff all the time. I know that, um, I was really, lucky to be in this situation, regardless of how hard I work. But it does, it does put you into this um, spotlight that uh, gives you privilege and, you know, gives you opportunity, but also separates you from some of those groups that maybe you felt really comfortable in before. Like, you know, a lot of times you, you don't have peers. Um, you know, I could, there was no one I could call up and say, hey, what's it like to go to the Oscars? Like, how should I prepare for that? You know, like, there's just, there's, there's no one you can talk to about it. And, you know, it's it's awesome. It's great. But it also it, it can um, create weird dynamics um, with other other writers sometimes, which was which was surprising to me. It shouldn't have been. But it did surprise me. Well, you know, writing is this weird. Uh, well, writing and publishing is this weird combination of commerce and art. Yep. Um, we, we all set out to make a beautiful piece of yep. art. Uh, and, and then somewhere along the way, you know, it gets wrapped up in commerce and, and, and I'm not discounting either one of those. We all want to make sure, uh, do not, do not get me wrong. We, you know, I, everybody wants to do this for a living and everybody wants to, um, cause it doesn't matter how beautiful the thing is that you write. If no one buys it and reads it, you, you haven't done your job. Um, so getting it out to an audience is all part of it as well. Uh, but fantasy writer, uh, Brandon Sanderson was on the show one time and, and he said, it's this really weird thing. He said, because I have friends who play basketball like every Thursday yep. night or whatever. And, and playing basketball is, uh, is very important to them. It's good for their, uh, physical well-being. It's good for their mental well-being. It's good for them to, uh, to be with friends and this uh, camaraderie, and it's it's a very important piece of their life. Yet no one is is hounding them uh, about when they're going to go to the NBA. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but as soon but as soon as you tell someone that you're writing a novel, they they immediately you know affix this uh, this certain worth and importance to it. Well, you know, are you do you have an agent yet? Have you got it sold? And and, and there's you know, no just, end to those sometimes, questions. I, and even, even if no, you hit the oh, New York sure. Times bestseller list, it's like, when are you going to do that again? When are you going to go to the Oscars again? You know, so oh, yeah. I'm sure that only amplifies. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's crazy. So it's this it's this really weird thing that doesn't fall into one bucket or another the way we want things in life to. Uh, we want to file things away very easily, and and uh, you know, uh, writing is this this weird combination, and it's a uh, it's a uh, a balancing act. It's it's very strange. Um, so after the Silver Linings Playbook, so um, the the sophomore effort is is difficult for a lot of people, and uh, you know, I've I've talked to musicians who uh, have explained it like this, that uh, before you're discovered, you, you work on a batch of songs forever. You know, you've got all the time in the world to put that first album together, and you've worked on it for years and years and years. And then, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you record it, you sell it, all of that stuff, and then you go to make that second album, and you've got like six months to put it together. And, and while you're doing that, you're shopping for drapes and carpet because now you've got money to buy mm. a house. And, and, you know, life completely changes. Uh, so what was that sophomore effort for you? Like, because this was not just writing a second book. This was writing a book after, uh, you know, Silver Linings and all of the craziness with that. Well, it was interesting because, um, you know, Silver Linings was published. And then, you know, it, it, it had a little nice ride for a debut novel. You know, we got, I remember we got a really nice review in the Wall Street Journal and really good review in the Philly Inquirer. But, you know, it wasn't a runaway bestseller out of the gate. Um, it wasn't until the movie was made several years later that it really took off. Uh, so it wasn't like my my life was radically different. Like what happened was I was living with my in-laws in Massachusetts. And because we did a movie deal, I was able to move into a small apartment and pay my own bills, you know? So it wasn't like I went out and bought a Maserati or anything like that. Uh, you know, it was really and what I did with the money that came in is I, I, I thought, how can I make this last as long as possible so I can write fiction full time and also pay my rent. And so we lived 
very modestly. And, um, you know, that, that was the priority. My wife was writing too, and she happened to sell, uh, her first novel at the time. And so I was writing a sophomore book, but it really wasn't, it was before, you know, the, the huge blow up of the Oscars, which in retrospect was really a blessing. But I wrote a book called Why You Came This Way that my agent and I loved. And my editor at the time, Sarah Crichton, she she didn't like it. She hated it. And she didn't buy it. And it kind of put us in this weird place where we didn't know what to do. And everything was kind of in limbo. And my agent said to me, you know, listen, I think this book is good. You know, I think we should sit on it. But, you know, any Matthew Crick project is going to be much better received if there's a movie out. And so we knew that the Weinstein company was working on the film, but we didn't know when it would come out. And so he said, I think we need to wait on this. And I said, well, what should I do? Because, you know, this is my full time gig. And I remember I was on a park bench in New York City with him. and It's super hot. I've told this story a million times and sweating. And he said, I think you should write a YA book. And, you know, my genre snobbery kicked in my m you know my mfa guy you know snobbery kicked in i said i do not write genre you know and he rolled his eyes and he said you know <laughs> you write first person stuff you know like he's like you write voicey stuff you know it'd be perfect for why and he's like catch her in the eye like that's ya you know it's just just set it from the point of view of a teenager and i thought to myself well i could be jd salinger like that sounds good you know like, as ridiculous as that is <laughs> Um, and so I, I started writing for um, young adults. You know, that, that was our plan, you know, to kind of diversify, you know, my career. And, and it was a really smart plan, uh, you know, to ditch the genre snobbery and say, hey, here's an opportunity to diversify your career. And I wrote this book called Elephant Mouse, which was this super weird YA book. It was it was me trying to do you know, like Haruki Murakami writes a YA book kind of thing, you know, and again, maybe it's some snobbery lingering. It wasn't really, it, it was Matthew Crick in a lot of ways, but I'm, I'm glad it wasn't published. Um, but there was one editor at Little Brown by the name of Alvina Ling, who has published all my YA books. And she, she really liked the book. And she's like, I like this, but I'm not going to publish it. And she said, it's just too, too strange and bizarre. Like it's not marketable, but I like it. <laughs> And she said, it, I yeah, and she, she said, if you, if you want to write something else for me, like, I will be very interested. But this is just not commercial. It's just too crazy. It's too wild. It's too bizarre. <laughs> um, and so I said to myself, all right, challenge on. And so I wrote this book called Sort of Like a Rockstar. Um, and she loved it. She absolutely went nuts for it. And so we published that. And that was my second book. Um, and Sort of Like a Rockstar is 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 very quirky and it's um written from the point of view of a young woman which was kind of a jump for me uh and it's a book that people immediately either absolutely love or hate it's just so polarizing and but the people who love that book like it's their favorite book like they absolutely love that book and and so you know and i wrote it i didn't really i just thought it was kind of like my my b B side, you know, like this, this YA stuff is just going to be this thing I'll do to make money or, you know, it wasn't like I was phoning it in. Like I was actually trying to write a good book, but in the back of my head, I thought, you know, the, the adult books are the real thing and this will be something I do on the side. But what happened was the response to the book was, was so great in a lot of ways. And I really enjoyed working um, with Alvina and at Little Brown that I went on to write, um, three other YA books that I'm super proud of. And to this day, I, you know, the, the most fan mail I get is, is from, for the YA stuff, you know, and it comes not just from teenagers, but from adults as well. And, uh, I realized that there weren't a lot of people in the, I shouldn't say a lot. There weren't enough people in the YA world talking about mental health stuff openly. And, you know, a lot of the the letters I get from teenagers who have read, you know, Boy 21 or Forgive Me, Leonard Peacock or um, Every Exquisite Thing, you know, they'll say, you know, I've never read a book like this. And like, this is what I'm going through. And, you know, it's it's exactly the experience that I wanted to have when I was 16. Um, you know, so it, it felt I'm really proud of that. Um, and when kids or young people say, I was in a really dark place mental health wise and I was feeling really lonely and your book made it a little easier to get through even a single day that's on mission for me it feels good um so you know it's it's strange because it was something that i 
I didn't want to do, um, that I thought like, that's not me. Like I'm not the YA writer. And, you know, to this day, I, I still take flack from genre snobs and, you know, academics who, you know, will dismiss me as a quote, you know, young adult writer, like as if that's derogatory, but I don't care about that anymore. Cause I'm really proud of, of those books. And, you know, I think that they've put some good into the world and, you know, they've led to amazing opportunities both in New York and in LA as well. So, you know, I think the moral of the story is maybe get over yourself and, you know, <laughs> shake the hand that comes towards you and write what you're asked to write. Cause you know, you can always be authentic in any project, no matter what the project is. Um, and when I let go of those rules I had for myself, some really cool experiences emerged. And, you know, I have my agent, Doug Stewart, to thank for that. Well, you know, it's this weird uh, thing that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, about how uh, writing straddles those, uh, the, you know, those two worlds of art and commerce. And and it's not wrong uh, to, to want to target an audience because, uh, you know, you do have something to say and, uh, you can have something to say all day long. And if it doesn't get to anyone, you haven't done it. Absolutely. Um, you know, so, uh, I, I think that's fantastic, you know? Um, and, and I love that you, you wrote a, a, a transition book to get your head in that space. I, I love that. Um, what was it, uh, like when you're looking at the genre, so first off, you, you know, you kind of turn your nose up a little bit. You, you got the, the, the genre snob thing going on. Um, but when you decided, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it the way Matthew Quick would do it. Um, what did you see in the genre that needed, uh, I guess what I'm trying to ask is where did you see, um, that the genre needed some truth, uh, and, and some humanity and how did you set out to bring, uh, your own style to an existing genre? You know, um, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I was, I, I didn't do a lot of reading of YA books before I started. It was really, I don't know how I phrased it before, but the truth is it wasn't until after I started publishing that I realized there weren't a lot of um, people talking about mental health in the way I was talking about it. And the way that I knew that was because young adults for contacting me and saying, I, this is the book I've been waiting for. Um, you know, and it was later that I read, you know, stuff like Perks of Being a Wallflower, which I, I hadn't read when I started writing YA. And uh, I said, wow, like, I, this is a book that I wish I had read when I was in, in high school. Um, you know, and the, you know, I'm not going to go through all the name dropping, but I, I think, I think it was really, I think the best thing I did was to say, I don't really know a lot about this genre. And so I'm just going to tackle it my way. And, you know, I, I think maybe some people need to read a lot and to understand. But, and, I, and I guess I did. I took a Bill Dungsrum on a uh, course in college. And I remember reading, you know, like The Chocolate War. And, um, and of course, you know, teaching, you know, uh, The Catcher in the Rye every year. I, I understood that, you know, the, the young adult book is about, trying to get the protagonist to adulthood safely you know that's that's pretty much what you do in a YA book but I think if I had gone out and read a bunch of YA books at the time I don't know that that would have been a good thing for me to do um, yeah. because it would have said to me oh this is what they're looking for so I should try to be like this and really it's they don't know what they're looking for. Like, that's the thing. Like when Alvina read elephant mouse, I think she saw something in that, that she said, this guy, I'm interested in this person, you know, and like, I can't yeah. sell this, but he's got something that I'm interested in. Um, and I didn't consciously go back to the page and say, all right, sort of like a rock star, like let's make something commercial. Cause in a lot of ways, I don't think sort of like a rock star is a very commercial book. Um, even though we've had some success and, you know, it's, there's been a lot of interest in Hollywood for it. Um, it was just me saying, all right, I'm going to mine this other part of myself and get that on the page. And I'm just going to follow the gen the general rules of what a YA book is. Like if I had said, here's my YA book, it's set from the point of view of a 67 year old man, like they would say no, but you know, <laughs> there, there are certain <laughs> things you have to do, but within that, I think you can, your job is to make it as authentically you as possible. And I think that's what um, attracts people. You know, a lot of people who read my YA stuff, you know, let's say like, I haven't read anything like this before, you know, and that's, that's why they like it. So I, I disagree with people who say, you know, in order to 
to write in a certain genre, you have to maybe read everything in that genre. Maybe that's not bad. It's just that's not how I work. Yeah. Well, as a, as a, I, my wife and I have five kids, and our oldest is twenty two, but the other four are all teenagers, and uh, and they're they're avid readers and uh, and very opinionated about what they read. Mm. And I'll tell you one thing: they do not look look for in in books is is formula. Yeah. They they don't want the books to all be the same. And, uh, you know, uh, they may love John Green, mm-hmm. uh, but when they find another author, they don't want to read John yeah, Green again. They want to read what Matthew Quick has sure, to say. Sure. And uh, so, you know, it's really weird that we, we come up with these formulas and stuff, and then when someone does something completely off the wall, um, you know, readers usually, um, you know, really connect with that. Um, but uh, what did you learn writing YA that surprised you from what you thought you knew from teaching YA? Well, I never taught, um, you know, I, I, my agent said, you know, Catch and Rise YA, but, you know, Salinger didn't write that as a YA book. You know, I think YA is kind right. of a new thing. Yeah. Um, what surprised me was, um, I guess maybe, you know, I said before that, there's this kind of snobbery, which didn't exactly surprise me, but just how pervasive it is. Uh, I had, I think it was Sarah Zar who told me this may, maybe And Sarah, I apologize if this wasn't you, but she said, it's like playing for the JV team, you know, like, and I, and I guess like, that's what I thought when I was getting into it too. But then when you write this book that, um, you know, like my book boy 21 was reviewed, you know, had it got a fantastic review in the New York times and it was a finalist for LA book prize. And like, but then people will be like, Oh, it doesn't really count. And you're like, Whoa, well, you know, it's, this is, this is a great book. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, before I, I had that snobbery and then like, once you're in that world, you, you're kind of surprised that not only that you had it, but just how pervasive it is. The other thing that surprised me, I guess, was how many adults will read the books Oh, you know, yeah. and oh yeah, uh, maybe because I wasn't reading young adult books and I had that genre snobbery. But you know, I I get so many um, fan mail from you know uh, people who are older than me, and and sometimes it's their teachers, so that makes sense because they're around young people all the time. But some people are just fans, you know, of of the work, and they don't even read it as like a young adult book. They'll they'll just maybe enjoy some of my adult books, and then they'll just go through my whole backlist and they'll say i didn't even know this was a young adult book when i bought it and i wouldn't have bought it if i knew that but then i really enjoyed it so that's always surprising in a good way too but i this stuff bothered me a lot at first and now i think i've kind of gotten over it and uh i i just try to whenever i sit down to write a story i just say i'm going to do the best job i can you know and i'm not going to think about labels or genres or ratings or stars or you know of course when you're in your low moments you think about all those things but at some point I think you just kind of you get to a point with the writing where it just transcends all that stuff and you know like what you were saying before um about commerce I, I I try to think of it as when I'm in my office alone writing I'm a fiction writer when I send the book to New York or LA I'm a businessman and, you know, I, put, I I try to put on different hats, you know, so when I'm writing, I don't think about how it's going to be marketed or what people are going to say or how it's going to be reviewed. You know, it's only afterwards. You know, I was on the road for the last three weeks um, for the book tour for the reason you're alive. And you're very much a salesman. You know, I think about Willie Loman out on the road, you know, and um, you're, you're selling all the time, you know, and you're you're you're, you're trying to get sales and you're reporting back to your publisher and. Um, you know, it's, it's fun to be out on the road and you you definitely appreciate it. And again, it's a privilege to have that experience, but I, man, I just can't wait to get back into my room alone and and start writing again. Like that, that's where it is for me when I can shut all that stuff off and, and, you know, I can do that with, it doesn't matter if it's YA or a screenplay or an adult, like the magic still happens when I'm, I'm alone with my characters and like, I still love doing that. Um, and that, that surprises me every day and it really beautiful way that I I never get tired of it. Like when I go back to the page and start writing again, I start to feel healthier. And 
I think that's a good sign that maybe you're a fiction writer. <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, speaking of that brand new book, The Reason You're Alive, uh, it's been out just a couple of weeks now. Uh, well, it came out to 4th of July. And uh, it's uh, it's uh, back in the um, uh, in uh, out of YA in the standard uh, fiction, mm-hmm. uh, if you will. Um, tell us a little bit about this book. It, this is a, a a little bit of a departure if you uh, if you're coming from 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 your YA stuff. But uh, it looks like um, uh, a a deeply uh, a, 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 a deep study of, of this character, David Granger. Tell, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, David Granger is a Vietnam vet who um, has a brain tumor, which he attributes to Agent Orange exposure. And after he has the tumor taken out, he loses his filter. Um, he, he just says whatever <laughs> comes to mind. Uh, and so... This is both good and bad because we learn that he has a lot of opinions that are perhaps not politically correct, to put it mildly. Um, But we also learn that David has some secrets, some really dark secrets that go all the way back to the Vietnam War that he hasn't, you know, come to terms with. Um, We learn that he's in conflict with his extremely liberal son, Henri. Um, But we also learn that he has this granddaughter, that he loves, um, you know, and that he really loves his country. And he's made these unique friendships with very unlikely people that his son does not know about out of necessity because he's been banished from his family. And he goes out into the world and no longer is everyone, you know, straight white male, you know, Um, he has to interact with people who are not like him and figure out how to do that. And I wrote the book before, um, I finished it before the last presidential election because a lot of people asked me, you know, is this in response to Trump? And uh, when I was writing the book, I had never dreamed that our country would be, you know, where it is today. But I think it's really applicable. And one of the things I've been talking about on book tour was I come from a really conservative Christian family, um, you know, war vets. My grandfather fought in World War II, my uncle in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, growing up, I, I was tell you I was fundamentalist Christian Republican conservative because that's what my grandfather was and I loved him more right than anything um, but of course when I went to school uh, when I went to college I went to liberal arts university it was Catholic and you know progressive uh, my grandfather before I went he said to me don't listen to anything that your college <laughs> professors teach you because they're all liars and you know they're gonna lie and I didn't know what that meant when he said that to me. It was very confusing because he was encouraging me to get a college degree, but I wasn't supposed to listen to what the professors were saying. It was very confusing. (laughs) But within a week of college, I knew exactly what he meant because, you know, I was a secondary ed major. So all of my professors were extremely liberal, like the complete antithesis of my grandfather. And all of my friends were poets and musicians and writers and, you know, liberal people. And my needle you know, started to go left immediately. And it put me a little bit of culture shock. Yeah, my worldview changed radically instantly. And it put me in conflict both ways. Because when I went home, you know, and the comments were made around the dinner table it was no longer easy for me to sit there and listen to them the same way I did when I was a kid. But you know, the same thing when I was at school and someone would make a comment about, you know, right wing nut jobs. Like, you know, I knew that they were talking about my tribe. They were talking about my blood, you know, my grandfather and my uncle, people that I love. And to this day, you know, especially in the age of Trump, you know, I, most of the people I work with and I'm friends with are extremely liberal. But of course, my family is still conservative. So, you know, if I go home, I, I hear comments about the left that are not really informed. But a lot of times when I I hang out in New York and L.A. or with, you know, my my liberal friends who with whom I tend to agree with. They'll make comments about people on the right. And I'll think to myself, I might agree with your comment, but the way that you're talking about these people lets me know that you've never met anybody like this. Um, You know, and it's it's hard for me to hear like these very dismissive, um, divisive, angry, bitter comments uh, directed at people that they don't know. Um, at least not the way that I know them, you know, because I grew up with these people. And so, you know, I wanted to write a book that might highlight that gap um, 
you know, maybe offer a bridge of some sorts. Because David Granger is a character, especially if you're extremely liberal, that you're going to think you're, you're not going to like him on the first few pages. But if you keep turning pages, um, and the reports have been, you know, pretty consistent with this, you'll find that there are things you are going to like about him, and he might surprise you in some ways. Um, and that's my favorite comment where a lot of people have written me or talked to me at the book tour. They said, first five pages, I thought I wouldn't even make it through this book. I hated this guy so much. It's like I got I got to the end of the book. I was crying. I didn't want to let him go. I loved him, you know, by the end. Oh, and that's that's to me, you know, on mission. You know, that's to me promoting empathy, understanding and maybe starting a dialogue. You know, and if that can happen, that's that's beautiful. Well, it, it's and it's uber important right yep. now. Uh, and this and this is where writers and artists have to step up because um, it seems like our society is dominated by 24 hour news channels that all are pushing an agenda right or left or, or, or whichever. Yep. And, and they're, they're trying to build their tribe and it's super easy. Uh, you know, if, if you've got people who would just assume the other side is always wrong and are always evil. And, uh, and this is where we need writers to step up and say, you know what? Um, people are people and we all believe different things, but it doesn't mean our motives are all wrong and, and all of that. And, uh, I'm, I'm super happy you've written this book to, uh, uh, to kind of peel some of that back. Um, how fun is it to write a character that has no filter? <laughs> it's, it's great. You know, it's <laughs> because you know, it's, it's, it's so audacious and, um, yeah. you know, just to step into that mind is so freeing because of course I'm, I, I, I think words matter and I pick my words very carefully and I tend to be obsessive about things. So, um, I'm always self-editing. I'm always being very careful about what I say. So, you know, to step into David Granger's mind was it was liberating, even though the things that he was saying are not necessarily things that I would say or I agree with. Uh, it, it felt very freeing to to have no filter as I was I was writing it, even though I was writing in his voice. Uh, and it was fun because I was laughing the whole time. And, you know, it's just I think sometimes, too, especially in this modern era, uh, we forget that we live in America and like we can say audacious things. Again, I'm a writer, so I know that words have power and I know that words can be used as weapons. But I also think we, we forget that, um, you know, we need to be able to, to say things to get to the heart of things. You know, I've been talking about this on book tour too. Like you can teach somebody to, to use politically correct language. That doesn't mean they're not racist. You know, like sometimes we need, we need yeah. to know what people are thinking so that we can have discussions about those things. Um, and sometimes, you know, we need conflict. We need, we need to have people triggered or we need to have people, you know, in uncomfortable conversations. We can't just sanitize everything because, um, you know, humans are complex creatures and, you know, people say things for reasons. Um, and we need to know what those reasons are. And we never get to the heart of things if we don't, if we, we don't talk honestly about our feelings. And, and I think that's what's so great about David Granger is you trust him when he says the good stuff because you know he, he'll tell you exactly what he's thinking, even though if it's to his own detriment. So, you know, if he, he says everything. So when he says the bad stuff, you're like, wow, like, I really don't agree with that, but at least I know where he stands. And then when he says the good stuff, you're like, well, there's no motive here because he's just telling you exactly what he thinks. And I think people can work with that. You know, I think people can work with that. The book is called The Reason You're Alive. Uh, Matthew, uh, I have absolutely loved uh, this time uh, chatting with you. Where can people find you online if they're not familiar with your work and they want to kind of dig through your back catalog and get connected with you? Oh, the best place is my website, MatthewQuickWriter.com. Um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Twitter is MatthewQuick21, at MatthewQuick21, and Facebook is just MatthewQuick. You just Google me and I'll be there. Excellent. Uh, Matthew, thank you for taking time out of your day to come on the show. Hey, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Stay tuned now for a clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Glebes. There's a link to the entire series in the show notes. As always, tune in every Tuesday and Friday for new episodes of the Author Stories podcast. Find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. Now on to our clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Glebes. Natalie? It's Artie. Listen, I'm going to be late for dinner. I ran out of gas on... 
He climbed out of the car and peered at the sign. On Sleepy Hollow Road? There's nothing but trees, and I have to find a gas station. Save me a drumstick. He hung up his cell and stuck it in his pocket, zipping his jacket. He was going to have to walk and pray somebody picked him up. A sliver of crescent moon hung above, surrounded by clouds, like a grinning drunk asleep in a puddle. Artie walked, using his tablet as a flashlight, eyes on the gravel ahead. He crossed over a dark ravine. The trunks and overhanging branches were matted thick with wild grapevines and threw a cavernous gloom over the road. A figure stood at a crossroads ahead. It looked pale and wan and blue. A woman? He had an impression of fragility and age and thought of his warty old landlady. But his landlady would not be standing at a crossroads in the dark. Excuse me? Artie said, surprised by the fear in his own voice. Do you know where I can find a gas station? I'm... I'm empty. Then let me feel you, the figure whispered. It rushed at him. It entered him. He dropped the tablet, fell to his knees, and lost his body to another driver. When Artie woke again, he was dangling in midair. The woods were pitch black. The only lights were fireflies. Fireflies everywhere, like dancing stars. He struggled and cried out, his yellow sneakers trying to find the ground. Shh, said a voice. It will all be over soon. Panic rose. He felt invisible hands on his legs, on his arms, invisible fingers around his neck, reaching up the back of his shirt. He heard the sound of water running below, high and agitated, as if through a stony brook. The crescent moon swung out of the sky, falling into the water. Blood rushed into his cheeks. He realized he had been flipped upside down. He yelled and groped, flecking his own face with spit, helpless to drive away whatever was attacking him. He felt a sharp pain between his shoulder blades, and air flew out of his lungs. A spray of blood hit his cheeks, hot and clinging. His hands found a sharp branch protruding from his body. It had speared him through his back and out through his chest. He tried to say help, but had no air to form the word. Blood poured up his body. No, it poured down. It only felt as if it were rising, climbing his neck, covering his face, gathering in his scalp. He reached for the ribbon of blood that fell from his crown into the trickle of moonlight below. The ribbon slipped through his fingers. It thinned, choked, became a tiny rivulet. His tanks were empty, not even fumes. His engine began to sputter. The flow became a drip, a maddening drip like the drip, drip, drip of his kitchen faucet, the drip his landlady hadn't fixed, the drip that kept him up at night. This drip would not be keeping him up. He would sleep very well this night, very well indeed. The fireflies slipped into shadow. A figure appeared, blue as gaslight, bony and toothless, a crone from a fairy tale. Thank you, my friends, she whispered. I am thankful for this good harvest. She neared, scrutinized him with manic intensity, and turned away, muttering to herself in a sing-song rhythm as she, too, vanished into the trees. A man may toil from sun to sun, but a woman...